Yes, I do not know how you felt, uh, but just thinking that Elon Musk uh, wants uh, to build a reactor gives me the shivers. So let's make sure that we do not achieve a stage that somebody who has just uh, exploded a rocket because he celebrates this as success, that this person would um, uh, seek to play around with such technologies. So thank you very much, Matthias Englert, for this great overview you provided in spite of the difficulties you faced with. And I say so, looking straight into the camera, and it was great to have uh, listened to the applause. And thanks to likes streamed by Dove TV from Darmstadt, Matthias Englert can follow our meeting. As mentioned before, in the afternoon, Matthias Engelt uh, will uh, uh, join uh, the panel so that he can answer the questions you will be so kind to share with us during the lunch break. Well, for the subsequent expert presentations, there will be the uh, opportunity to ask questions on the presentation immediately after the presentation. And general questions will then be discussed in the general panel in the afternoon, because all the experts will then attend the panel. And this leads us to the next expert, Friederike Fries. And there is a lot of overlapping uh, with uh, our key note speaker, Matthias Engel, let, because like Mr. Engler, Friederike Fries uh, studied physics in Darmstadt at the Technical University, and uh, well, a bit later than he did, but uh, at least she saw him there at university. And then after completing her studies in physics, uh, where she took her directorate in Darmstadt, she went to the Technical University in Denmark and Vienna. So, no, while she still studied, she had uh, studied trips in Denmark and Vienna. And in Vienna, she liked it so much that many years later, she returned to Vienna. And now she works as a senior researcher at the Institute for Safety and Risk Sciences at the University of Natural Sciences and Applied Life Sciences in Vienna. This is where she does research and also teaches. And her research focuses uh, on new reactor technologies and the possible impacts of their use. Uh, Frederike Fries is a member of the board of uh, the International Nuclear Risk Assessment Group, INRAG, and she is also the deputy chairperson of the Research Association for Science Disarmament and International Security. And she also, as uh, the Austrian delegate, uh, represents Austria in the joint IEA uranium group uh, with the OECD. And in the future, she will be the Austrian delegate with the Science Technology Committee with Eurotom. And focusing on the technical aspects, uh, you actually need to ask yourself and this is what Frederica just told me. So this leads to the question of whether permits can be issued for such concepts. And this is the area she has been focusing on. And so this is what her presentation will focus on, licensing of small modular reactors. Uh, Frederica, the chair is yours. Uh, the floor is yours, excuse me. Good morning. My presentation is already on the screen, and uh, I realized that uh, Matthias Englert's uh, title is, um, of course, much um, 
better because it's SMRs and uh, novel um, technologies. Uh, everybody has a different definition of all these terms. But I'm going to look at uh, what um, would happen if we license these SMRs. Uh, there are two uh, points that I would like to address. Um, first of all, what regular approaches exist and um, looking at current safety standards, uh, can these actually be applied to novel systems? And I have this picture for you. Uh, there are SMRs. They exist. Uh, this one is in Bilibino in eastern Siberia, four times 11 megawatts, uh, built in the 1970s. One of the plants has already been decommissioned. This is in a very um, distant um, uh, region where 15,000 people used to live. Now only 5,000 people live there, and um, uh, it serves a mine. And this is actually where the academic Lemonosov is going to be uh, um, applied. It's a small SMR um, on a ship um, to uh, serve uh, 70 people. Uh, just uh, a little repetition. Not all SMRs are the same. Um, the power output is different from kilowatt hours to 300 uh, megawatts. Uh, um, thinking of kilo and mega, this means that uh, the difference is a factor of 30,000. There are also different applications. Uh, could be mines, Arctic communities, uh, centralized large scale units. Um, remote small-scale units, uh, replacement for existing um, power plants. Uh, one could say, of course, um, the four, uh, VV um, uh, 1140 is not so far removed from the 300 megawatts. Uh, um, there could be single units, multi-units in one site, and it could be light water reactors or all other nuclear reactor designs, which uh, Matthias described. The re relevant thing is what is uh, the background? Is it uh, uh, passive safety? Is there passive safety? Is um, uh, there high risk, etc.? Let me give you two examples. The new scale will recur because it's very important. It's a licensed reactor, and uh, it's supposed uh, to be um, um, placed next to each other with 12, 6, 4 modules uh, in one location. It's a small conventional reactor, uh, or it could be even she, a micro reactor, clearly smaller. Um, the advantage being that there is no uh, emergency planning zone because uh, um, it's so small that it's not necessary, and there is um, um, got, um, and the system works with trisofuel, the little spherical things. Uh, you remember that? Uh, no. Let's talk about various approaches uh, to regulation. The first approach, which is widely widespread, is prescriptive. Uh, and NRC says that it's a comprehensive regulatory guide prescribing detailed acceptance criteria to meet regulatory requirements. So specific requirements that have to be fulfilled for licensing. Why NRC, the US uh, licensing authority, they have a large scale reactor Pro, uh, program. They are very open about it. Um, uh, it's uh, online, you can read it up, and it's in English, uh, which uh, is an advantage um, um, as opposed to French uh, for France. And uh, it's really uh, like a checklist that you can tick. Um, to see what you fulfilled. Um, there was a lot of learning involved uh, from serious accidents, uh, from severe accidents. There was extensive research, uh, like initiating events um, and uh, uh, things that happen outside the design bases. Uh, um, and of course, the computer codes have be have improved, uh, um, which helps uh, to better understand accidents, uh, um, helps experiment and uh, identify physical phenomena that can occur. Um, as a consequence, the licensing framework developed uh, together with the technology and the high-level principles apply to uh, 
all reactor designs. Um, while uh, the direct criteria are very specific to designs. And if you build an SMR based on light water reactor technology, it's easy to actually uh, um, fulfill the criteria and transfer the criteria to uh, the principles there. So it makes it easier for the licensee and the regulator. Uh, the same path will take more time for uh, non-lightweight reactors. And um, prescriptive regulatory approach uh, is something that is being used by almost all countries. Performance-based regulation is the second approach. Again, uh, NRC has a definition for that. It's a regulatory practice that establishes performance, uh, um, for example, dosage in the near surroundings. But the licensee is free to choose how um, it wants to reach that uh, parameter. So actually, you have uh, the, the dosage, um, and uh, you also have a criterion for meaningful full threshold. Um, and NIC uh, says that if you if there is one criterion um, uh, that you cannot uh, uh, meet, um, then uh, it depends on how big the uh, trade-off uh, against performance is. Uh, so, um, Potential licensees uh, uh, know what they um, have to expect. It's like 12,000 pages. You work through it. It's like um, um, a cookery book, and uh, you tick all your boxes. Uh, that's uh, for uh, light water reactors. For other reactors, uh, you have draft part 53, um, which is potentially open to all reactor types, but I would uh, not expect anybody um, with a light water reactor to go through that procedure um, because it's um, um, totally um, unfathomable. Um, then the third approach is the goal setting approach. Uh, it's very outcome based, uh, and the regulatory authority simply says it has to be saved. Um, of course, uh, they say that uh, uh, there are broad regulatory requirements, but licensees determine um, how important they are and um, how they can be achieved. And uh, of course, um, licensees can be very innovative, uh, um, and they can adopt practices that meet their particular situation. But um, of course, uh, um, that might also be difficult, but let's have a look at the international situation. Um, the uh, IAEA um, defined the uh, supreme safety objective, meaning to protect people and the environment from harmful effects of ionizing radiation. And uh, from this, they derive uh, um, associated safety principles, um, a top-down uh, um, approach um, with safety standards, um, drilling down to the very detail. It's a very international list of rules and regulations, but it's not binding. It has to be transferred into national regulation. However, most countries have self-committed themselves to IAEA standards. Within IAEA, there are um, various uh, standards dealing with SMRs. Um, and these uh, uh, standards are actually uh, um, worked with by uh, uh, various uh, committees and fora, the nuclear safety standards uh, committees. Uh, um, they uh, work a lot with SMRs. Uh, then there is the explicit SMR regulators forum. And then um, when um, they found out uh, 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 that um, it wasn't all that easy, they uh, founded that forum. And then there's the Nuclear Harmonization and Standardization Group, NHSI. Uh, but the first thing that IAEA actually did was uh, 
um, identify uh, novel uh, systems. They develop the questionnaire and um, they send the questionnaire to SMR developers and also did that for generic designs because they said um, many of our standards are very technology specific and developed along the same lines as technologies, uh, for example, light water reactor technology. And um, this is now um, uh, considering new things like new hazards, water and the air ingress, um, chemical um, attacks, and new features of coping with these uh, hazards. Uh, and um, of course, uh, um, there are also uh, uh, um, it also includes, uh, for example, chemical attacks, which wouldn't have to do with the uh, actual SMR, but could come from the environment. Uh, um, um, could deal with sodium leaks when you have a uh, um, sodium cold reactor. And uh, of course, uh, there is, are also novel approaches um, to operation and maintenance. For example, remote operation where very few people are on site, um, maybe just uh, safety officers. Um, um, there are the so called walk away safe concepts. Uh, um, it's like I build it, it generates uh, electricity, and I leave it as it is. And uh, um, the seal core is also. A a uh, new concept. Um, these uh, cores are produced, are taken, um, taken to the site and uh, left there. Um, the inventory might be big uh, because um, this is uh, exchanged only every 10 years. Uh, um, IAEA has also started using a new uh, terminology talking about evolutionary innovative designs. Um, what uh, they say is they don't want to, to develop uh, additional standards for SMRs. They want to cover SMRs with their standards. And uh, they also say that uh, uh, it's not a political question. They decide. Um, they don't say whether um, SMRs have to be safer than others. Um, they just want the current standards to be met. And um, they want to find out what is new. This is why they devised the questionnaire. And um, they also wanted to see what the impact on uh, the existing standard was, uh, whether there were any gaps, uh, and uh, what needed to be considered in addition. And this is the wonderful diagram that they came up with. Green stands for this is good, we're good, no problem. Orange says that about uh, one third of the safety standard is impacted. Um, it doesn't look so bad at first sight. Let's start here. This is transport. When you look at SMRs that are transported, this is a very special niche. Um, here is the safety um, assessment. And here, um, these are um, items from design and construction. So what is my uh, reactor like? And um, we can take a closer look here. This is a bit more general. There are three um, safety targets uh, which uh, the uh, um, reactor has to fulfill, and it's critical criticality control. Uh, if the uh, reactor starts to get out of control, um, that's really bad. Cooling, of course, uh, um, has to be. Uh, well planned and uh, ra radioactive discharge has to be prevented. Um, and um, I gave you these three pictures showing what is different. Uh, um, one is the pebble bed reactor. Um, these are um, small spheres. They have the size of poppy seeds, actually. They're filled into bigger balls, into bigger spheres, and uh, these are filled into the reactor core. And uh, you don't um, exactly know which uh, um, sphere has been used up to what extent. Then there are the uh, new coolants, uh, for example, sodium, uh, lead, uh, lead can freeze if um, the uh, coolant circuit becomes too cool at some point. Uh, this is something that doesn't happen with water or graphite. Uh, yeah, and then as for 
uh, salt, uh, molten salt reactor. That's an experimental reactor with uh, a staggered, uh, um, uh, staggered um, um, safety system. We have the, the pebbles and the uh, safety barrier. Um, and then we have um, the bigger sphere around it. And then we have the uh, filling um, uh, rod and uh, if you don't have that, um, if you have more salt, then um, you um, are like faced with a constant uh, potential meltdown. Um, here is uh, um, uh, a list of um, the uh, siting design and construction factors, and there is still room for improvement in the reactor core, coolant, uh, associated system containment, fuel handling, and storage. Um, then um, you can, of course, also look at uh, um, the safety assessment. Um, pinks as well, uh, deterministic uh, analysis of uh, safety, but then you have uh, level one and then you have level two. And uh, to be able to understand that better, let's have a look at various uh, uh, safety assessments. It's very technical, so if this is not so interesting, just remember that there are different types of safety assessment. And, but possibly some of you might be interested, and uh, um, I think it's very interesting because this deterministic is what was originally done. You look at uh, um, what happens in the plant when certain events occur. So you have a list of potential initiated events, uh, 100 to 150 per plant, and then what uh, happens uh, um, what can happen and what uh, um, can you do? The turbine shuts off, so you have to um, you have to uh, um, shut down the uh, reactor. But you could, of course, also have to um, have to scram. Uh, and all these uh, um, events must be controllable. Uh, temperature in certain places must not uh, exceed a certain limit. Pressure must not exceed a certain limit. Um, and uh, these are very conservative calculation. Uh, if some feature is not available um, and some feature uh, is under repair, uh, um, you uh, need to be aware of that and you need to be aware of limits of safe operation. But if you have new designs, um, you also need um, to think of new criteria. For example, what happens if sodium coolant um, um, and water uh, are uh, combined? Then there's also the probabilistic safety as assessment. Uh, again, you have the list of initiating events, and do you have a, a tree for each uh, of these? Uh, um, for example, um, the uh, a, a pipe breaks. Uh, um, does the uh, high pressure feeding system work? Does the low pressure feeding system work? Um, and I actually um, look at all these uh, parts of uh, the tree and. Uh, for each component, you will also need a so-called fault tree. For example, um, you do uh, very long calculations uh, to determine the probability uh, of uh, uh, potential core damage fre frequency. Uh, 10 um, to the minus 5 uh, uh, for newer reactors, for example, and then um, level 2, uh, the uh, probability of large and early release frequency. And if uh, um, you could simply exchange a core, um, you wouldn't be so picky about this. Um, and it's uh, 10 to the minus 6 uh, uh, for newer reactors. Um, and you do that for um, external, internal um, uh, events, and you add it all up um, until you have a uh, 
bottom line. Um, however, you can actually um, shift uh, probabilities to reach the target um, level um, because you can shift uh, limits here and there. What are the key issues, the problems uh, in safety analysis? We don't know enough about physical phenomena. Sometimes we had experimental reactors uh, uh, that were similar, but um, experimental and operational data are scarce. And you don't know how to address uncertainties uh, when you have first of a kind reactor designs so which have never been tested before. Uh, that means limited um, experience. And it's also um, terms uh, like uh, design extension conditions that cannot be applied. Um, and again, um, you see the uh, um, review of the safety standard can be initiated when information is obtained obtained. This is the IAEA speaking, and it's kind of a, a um, chicken and egg predicament. But uh, to be more specific, let's have a look at the pebble bed reactor. We can see the 360,000 pebbles uh, that are um, passing through the core um, 150 times, and uh, we can um, look at how the design safety requirements can be applied to this type of uh, reactor and a small light water reactor. Um, all these are at the same time SMRs. And uh, this takes you to this picture where you can see um, design core, coolant containment. And for the light water reactor, it's uh, pretty good. Uh, um, down there, you have interpretation, but can still remain. But for the um, um, HGT uh, SMR, you can see blue. You need to change that to get a license for this type of reactor. And as I already insinuated, this is something uh, the people who build and want to sell these reactors are aware of. And within the IAEA, um, it's also known. So. Uh, the uh, uh, regulators that would like to uh, license SMRs got together and formed the forum, and they write position statements, uh, and they also um, see how um, certain standards can be adjusted, certain rules can be adjusted to um, suit um, um, SMRs. And they also have ideas on um, emergency planning zones. Um, they issued a working paper about that. And um, they became um, the ofi an official part of uh, NISHI. Um, nobody really calls it NHCI. I don't know why they do that. Uh, uh, Nishi uh, um, pushes for harmonization. Um, in the United States, pipes have to have a certain um, diameter in inches. In the rest of the world, it's not necessary. So actually, they want to agree on certain things internationally with uh, some site-specific adaptations, um, which, uh, of course, uh, would make sense if you want to sell lots of SMRs. And, uh, um, it, this uh, group was um, announced by IAEA uh, Director Rafael Grossi um, with the goal to facilitate the same and safe and secure deployment of SMRs and advanced reactors, uh, um, all with a view to meeting net zero goals and the Paris uh, commitments. Uh, uh, but uh, um, what they keep saying is we will only be able to hit the target in, by 2050 if we use nuclear energy, nuclear reactors. 
and uh, they also want uh, to harmonize and uh, cooperate because if uh, a certain type of reactor is licensed in Saudi Arabia, then this could be transferred. Um, and uh, the goal is that uh, you can build uh, um, a certain SMA once it's been licensed in one place. But uh, there's always the ultimate heat sink. Uh, there's always the heat exchanger. And this has to be different in the Arctic and in the desert. So um, technical details need to be adjusted to the site. But uh, this is what they wish for. Uh, who are the members or what are the members? Members, it's uh, representatives of the industry, regulators, operators from 33 countries. And uh, they say consider nuclear as a global fleet. So we would not have any national plans and uh, licensing mechanisms. Everything would be uh, international because the same safety standards are applied everywhere. But who chose the members? Um, obviously, Mr. Grossi did that uh, himself or with help from someone. Um, Germany is not part of the regulators. Uh, um, the Atomic Energy of Canada is not part of the industry um, representatives. It's um, interesting um, because the question arises, uh, why should the others adopt these standards or these recommendations? After all, um, it has to pass the Nuclear Standards Safety Committee and all the countries are represented there. But maybe it's just a big bubble where they sit uh, there and um, tell each other how important they are. But it's yet another uh, grouping of um, those fighting for more nuclear energy. Uh, let's have a look at the consequences. So something I assume everybody knows uh, that it was announced to uh, build an SMR in a Tamilin. Uh, it's not uh, so clear what kind of SMR this will be built. It is to be finished in 10 to 15 years, but I assume that we will learn more about it. So for more than 10 years, replacement for Futurami has been played, but the replacement has been postponed and uh, the authority is to be involved, but somehow the authority is not aware of the plan. The SMR. Then this gives us to new scale. I have 50 megawatt. I used to have 75. Matthias had another number. This is a light water reactor. It has uh, started the design process in 2000, state funded, and uh, certification process started in 2008 and in 2023. 15 years later it was completed and the final safety evaluation has lasted less than 42 months was celebrated as a success and it became will become operational in 2030 and a final example just to give you a feeling of what is going on in the field of licensing well let's have a look at the UK some 15 percent of electricity is the share in its uh, uh, nuclear share in its electricity the mix is 15 percent. There's a new SMR competition has just been launched, and the goal is the that the final investment decision is to be taken within the next five years, so the current uh, parliamentary period. And this brings us to Rolls-Royce, because Rolls-Royce is also a member of the standardization group of IAEA. And if you remember, the UK, the major goal uh, to be pursued is to make sure that it is safe. There's the generic design assessment. It's also possible since 2021 for SMRs, uh, but the big one uh, that is to be commissioned by Rolls-Royce um, is not covered, so the first step has been successfully implemented. Rolls-Royce and the authority have agreed on what forms part of the GDA, and now this brings us to the detailed technical assessment and until August 2023. Six, they want the confirmation for the design, and they plan to 
put the reactor online in 2029, within three years. So, and uh, summarizing, uh, the, what does this mean for regulation? So there needs to be lots of new build, uh, newly built reactors to meet the Nitzero goal by 2050. And I assume uh, that we all uh, agree that this is nonsense to fight the climate crisis by building nuclear reactors. Actors, but people who are right, rather in favor or neutral, they believe that this is a major issue. And this brings me to the argument, how do you quick succeed in quickly uh, granting licenses to me? For small designs uh, need less safety provisions. You can assume that it might be a legitimate wish in terms of graded approach. I mean, that I do not um, draw a differentiation between 300 and thousand, but maybe between 10 and thousands. But the bit larger reactors, lots of such reactors are to be built on one side. Is this still be, to be considered small then? But they say that they are 10 times as safe, uh, but 100 times as safe. If I build 100 such reactors, then, well, who can tell me more about the safety? And who decides which safety mechanisms are no longer so relevant for a special case? And certain low, so-called low-level uh, safety goals have uh, been downgraded. But this doesn't mean uh, that the proof uh, is uh, be as good as before, particularly for first of a kind. You need to provide proof why certain security goals have to um, be met or not to be met. So these are highly inconsistent and contradictory goals. In other words, to speeding up the process while at the same time meeting lower levels of security requirements. So, and so this is related to the IAA because they say that the safety standards are largely, appli largely applicable to small uh, modular reactors or advanced reactors, but particularly for the very basic areas of reactor design, you require more design-related information and standards need to be massively adapted. And if we define the standards as is currently used for light water reactors and if we also want to license them in the same way, then this would require a lot of time. And if we went for fast licenses, then we require different approaches. For instance, performance-based approach, you define high-level safety goals that have to be met, and then the licensee, are those who apply for a license, they can try to find out how they meet these safety requirements. And this brings me to a quote from the Western European Nuclear Regulators Association, and they also focused on that topic, and they say the label SMR in itself does not justify changes in safety requirements. Each design and application needs to be considered individually, taking into account case-specific characteristics. So what does this say? This means that we have to look at each SMR design individually, and the probability of approving licenses lots of such SMRs within a short period period of time is impossible because this is not possible due to the technology. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Frédéric Fries, for this very clear overview you provided into this difficult topic, because due to the large number of designs, it cannot be an, an easy thing. But you have really given us a great overview. We are um, slightly behind schedule, but if you have two urgent questions uh, that you would like to ask, well, we have time for such questions. Please uh, wait, wait for the microphone because we have a live stream here. Uh, microphones are arriving, however, from the back. Oh, do you want me to take one from the stage? No, 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 no. Uh, mics are arriving. Uh, 
member of uh, the province parliament. Well, thank you very much for this highly interesting presentation in uh, my uh, well uh, professional past uh, focused on uh, such assessments. As Macron said, Macron said, without military use, no civilian use, and no civilian use without military use. This has been a wake-up call for me, particularly France seeks to boost the topic of SMRs, and you know they think about um, um, nuclear powered um, uh, um, uh, submarines, uh, use it for airplane carriers. So, if we discuss the safety concerns and risks in terms of SMRs, and we notice that lots of standards are lacking, in how far will they be standard in the military field, and is there a risk that via military applications, reactors are put into operation, which are actually used for experimental purposes before standards for the civilian sector have been created. Because what we see, the military sector prevents us from access to documentation. And we assume that military use will be used as a pretext to uh, well, make for um, progress uh, well, uh, without informing us. So will uh, these standards also be applied for military? So if there is no research available yet, then they will not be applied for military uses. But I'm not an expert on regulation in the military field. And in how far, in terms of other technologies, there are different requirements for military and civilian applications. But an area where you need to draw a clear line is in English, we have the term safety and security, two terms. And I just talked about safety. When I talk about security, the risk of proliferation, and this is what I want to avoid in the military field. If I buy nuclear weapons, since I'm a nuclear weapon state, uh, then I want to produce in the nuclear weapons field what I cannot produce in the civilian area. And often it is said that one is not possible without the other, is that you require expert knowledge also for the military field, and that somebody that focuses on the civilian nuclear use likes uh, using the military basis because uh, lots of fundamentals have already been defined, but the interrelations, unfortunately, I cannot share information on that with you. I have no idea. Further questions? Yes, this one question. Mm -hmm. You have spoken about small modular reactors in Tamilin, and you said in 2030, 2032 to 2035, this reactor will have been completed. What type of reactor is it, and how realistic is this plan? I know that my, uh, the next speaker is um, more profoundly informed about that topic, and he will discuss that in the afternoon, but I have uh, addressed the issue, and they are not yet aware of the type of reactor that is to be built in Temelin, because what we know in the Czech Republic and the, is that they do not know yet. It will be built. No, it is to be built. This is what I said, but we do not know what type of yet. Okay, thank you. Frederike Fries, uh, thank you for the information. Give a warm hand. Oh, there is a question, a question in the midst of the applause. Somebody raised their hand. Yeah, we have a brief question. Gottfried, Gottfried, please. So in Austria, are there companies that are active in this area? Yes, there are such companies. What companies? Could you name them? There is the Graz reactor. And it's called Emerald, I think. But I do not know whether there are further such. But in Graz, uh, there is um, the development of a part of molten reactor. OK. Thank you very much. And this, after this great uh, presentation that required a lot of focus, uh, we will now have our lunch breaks until 5 past 1. And we start at 5 past 1. Thank you, Sharp. Thank you.